And uh, my name is Trevor. If we haven't met yet, I am the senior pastor here, uh, but I am not preaching today. I was supposed to be at a conference this weekend. I was going to be back for this morning. We're doing our baptism here uh, later on, which reminds me, if you're getting baptized today, make sure that uh, you meet me out in the lobby right after service, and they'll just give you a couple quick instructions. But yeah, I was supposed to be at a conference, and then there's apparently some problems with flights and things like that. And so After being in Miami airport all day Thursday, boarding a plane twice, and the captain coming on and telling us that they have timed out once again, uh, we did not get to go to the conference, but it's okay. That's just how God wanted it. So uh, anyway, I took the week off from preaching, so I didn't have to worry about all of that too, Uh, but we actually have uh, somebody really special that's going to come up and preach today. Uh, Pastor Pete Eyrig has been... um, can we say through the ringer? That, that, sure, yeah. He has been through the ringer. He has been uh, battling cancer. He's been going through chemo treatments. He has been uh, riding a roller coaster for many, many, many months now. And uh, he, he has been getting better. His, uh, all of his levels and everything are, are just getting stronger and stronger. He's physically getting stronger. And I said, you know what? I think a really good debut to have him back here was to ask him to come up and preach. So he is going to come up and preach today. If you would welcome him. And uh, he is going to bring, I'll get that for you, Pete. All right. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to be anywhere, (laughs) as they say. Um... I'm just going to sit, if you don't mind. Uh, This is the first time I have physically been in this church for eight months. Uh, For those of you, I'm sure many people have gone through your own health problems or cancer, either yourself or family members and stuff, you know how, how, what a roller coaster it is and how especially when you're going through treatment, you need to limit your exposure to anything because your immune system isn't all that great. So what I would ask you for the next 35 minutes is just inhale, okay? And then (laughs) when I leave, you can exhale. Uh, (laughs) So the the title of uh, my message today is, uh, what do you really believe? Uh, And... You know, I've been taking notes for the last eight months. Uh, I've, I've been involved in the church behind the scenes, zooming in and talking with Trevor and the other elders, and, and Amanda's been keeping me updated, my daughter. Um, so this message is really um, some lessons, some ahas I've had through this journey. I'm not saying my journey is the same as anybody else's, especially when you get talking about... Uh, cancer or a serious health issue, I don't think there's one way, correct way to respond to it. Everybody's got their own path. Even if you had the exact same, say, cancer as somebody else, the treatments are different, the way you respond to it is, your prognosis is different. So everybody's got their own path to walk. So whatever I say here, other than theologically, I'm not advocating one way or another, like, oh, you just got to do it like this. You know, I'm not here to dispense that type of advice. But I do want to uh, share with you some things that I've learned, uh, some light bulbs that have come off, some observations about this path that I've I've walked on for the, and my wife has walked on, my family, for the last eight months. So, um, if you go to the next slide, what we say we believe. Uh, we just uh, celebrated the Lord's resurrection uh, last week. And uh, remember, there, if there's no empty tomb, uh, there's no Christianity. That is the central fact, central belief, core tenet of Christianity. That's what we build our faith on, that Jesus came uh, in human form, God with the express purpose of dying on that cross for our sins and then breaking the power of death by resurrecting. And then he promised, I'm going to resurrect everyone at the end. 
So that is the core promise. And, and you find that core gospel message, gospel meaning good news. So what's the good news? Paul wrote to uh, a church that he founded in Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, that is the core gospel message. And uh, if, if you're uh, a believer, that's what you believe. That's what I believe. And interesting note about this passage, uh, biblical scholars agree most that this passage in Corinthians is the earliest creed from Christianity. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church in his ministry about 53 AD. Okay, so he had already been doing all his journeys for you know, almost 20 years. Um, and he says, you know, for what I received, I passed on to you. Well, where, where did he receive this? Now, obviously he had the Damascus Road conversion, but the, the scholarship says what he's referring to here is after I got converted, what did he do? Shortly thereafter, he went to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and James and all the other apostles and witnesses. Because remember, Paul was, was a, a persecutor of, of Christ. And then after his uh, resurrection, he had the appearance of Christ to him and was converted. So that meeting with Peter and James and other apostles and witnesses in Jerusalem happened probably about um, 38 A.D., so, you know, years before he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. And we think that Christ was, uh, was crucified in about 33, 34 AD. So you're talking about information, the gospel that was explained to him by Peter and James in Jerusalem no more than two years after Christ was raised. This is the earliest Christian creed we have, that meaning that the people who were there listening to Christ in his ministry, the people who were there witnessing the cross, the people who had seen Jesus resurrected, the people who were there at Pentecost, this is their core belief all the way from the beginning. It wasn't made up decades or by the Roman Catholic Church, you know, by Constantine 400 years ago. Oh, 400 years later. So this passage is really, really important. It shows you the belief uh, of the very first followers. And so I believe that, and most, most everybody calls themselves a Christian. This is a core tenet. But what happens when this like becomes more than just a... Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, that's great news. This is really cool. What happens when you have to really take this seriously? What happens when the rubber meets the road? Do, you know, what does this really mean? And, and do you understand the importance of that? And maybe another way of saying that is, what happens when you have to face your mortality? When somebody in authority says, you know, you not, might not make it out of this. You're like, oh, you know, that intersection of belief and your emotions and reality is, is an interesting intersection. And we all experience that vicariously through, uh, you know, uh, mortality through your family. You know, if, if you live long enough, your grandparents will, will pass and cousins and friends and all through our life you, you lose people death is as pastor tony says it's hovering at about 100 percent death rate in the world so everybody here is going to die you just don't think about it all the time and even when you think about it often it's someone else you're thinking about even if you're if it's a close loved one it's generally not something that you can contemplate for a long time for yourself 
So, what do you do with that? What, what do people do with that? And, and I, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, I, you know, through my studies, um, through my seminary work, I've done uh, quite a bit of uh, comparative religion studies. And you know, I was thinking about it, I was like, all right, so human beings on the planet, where do they think they're going to go when you die? If, if during those moments, say you're attending a funeral or you're attending a celebration of life, or maybe even it's yourself or somebody close to you is, is going to pass or just passed, um, where do those people go? Where are you going to go? Now, there's a lot of different answers in the world. Uh, this is something most people will think about every once in a while. But in, of course, most orga organized religions or spiritual practices have some kind of answer of, oh, this is what happens when you die. So if you're an atheist, it requires a bit of faith and, dit and uh, discipline to me, in my mind to be an atheist because you're saying there's nothing. You're going to die, you're going to rot, you're going to go back into minerals and little atoms and everything you were, everything that made you special, that baby that you held in your, your hand, you know, that, that, that miracle, the, the thing that makes you who you are, phew, nothing. There's nothing there. It's just a cold universe. And that's what I'm putting my, my two cents on. Uh, to me, that, that, you know, when you go look at, when you're on channel, channel 9 bridge and you're looking up at midnight when you're tarpon fishing and you see a zillion stars in the sky, it's hard, I would think, to maintain being an atheist. It's like, look at the handiwork of God. I mean, the things that cause awe and wonder in both people and in nature and the goodness of things, it requires a lot of work to, be, to maintain a, being an atheist, in my, my opinion. There's Eastern religions that have a whole bunch of different answers, some that you reincarnate you know, every time, either as a grasshopper or as another person, that your karma will tell you if you, have, you were doing bad things in this life, the next life you'll pay for it, and then you get better and better over a course of thousands of lives and, until you, you reach nirvana, or you can be sucked back into the Buddha Godhead. I, uh, there's just a lot of different versions of that. Judaism really is a, a emphasis on the righteousness of your life today, and they're really kind of fuzzy on the afterlife. There's, there's no Messiah, there's no second coming per se. Uh, Islam uh, does believe in a, uh, a God, a single God, and Muhammad's prophet, so when you die, you get weighed your good deeds versus your bad deeds, and are you believing in, were you submissive to the prophet? And that will in turn figure out where you're supposed to go. Christianity, we know, uh, our, our faith is that, you know, God came, came to earth in, in human form, uh, sacrificed, paid for our sins that we couldn't pay, started to put the world to right, and Jesus will come back, remake heaven and earth, and everybody who's ever lived will be bodily resurrected and either stay with God forever or not, depending on the choices they've made uh, to believe in Jesus Christ or not. Um, the last one, agnostic, is almost one, it's probably more becoming the default in the Western world, in the U.S. Agnostic meaning, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, I, there could be a God. I guess there's a God. I don't know. Maybe. We'll, 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 and the reason this one um, is harder for me to wrap my head around, because I'm a believer, and I, and I feel that in my bones, but I had a conversation with a person, uh, a guy in, in their 60s, a couple of years ago, and he knew I was, uh, you know, deep in our church and pastor and elder and stuff. And, and he wasn't necessarily a believer. And so we were talking about it. He was asking me, well, you know, why do you do that? And blah, blah, blah. I said, well, well, okay, if, if, if you're not into that, then have you ever thought about what happens when you die? You know, he goes, nah, 
I don't, I, don't, I don't think about it. I'm like, you don't think about it? I mean, people have been thinking about this since the dawn of time. I mean, it's like the one big question in people's lives because you, you see it. Where did grandma go? Is grandma floating around? Is she an aunt? Or what is it? The, the ability not to ask the question, to kind of just say, I ain't got to think about it. Eh, you know, it happens, it happens. I'll, I'll, feel, I'll figure it out when I get there. Kind of blows me away. And uh, the, the one, you know, they, they say that uh, there are no atheists in foxholes, right? When bad things happen, even atheists will get down and pray to something. You know, get me out of this or make a bargain or something. Uh, I believe there's a correlate to this that I've found in, in dealing with a lot of other uh, people diagnosed with what I have. Uh, I'm in support groups, and, and I love, love those support groups, and everybody has a different way of responding to this type of stuff. But I believe what I've seen is that not only are there no atheists in foxholes, there are no unquestioning agnostics in foxholes. If someone tells you, by the way, you've got something and it's probably going to kill you, or you've got X, or you've got a high likelihood that this is, might be a terminal event or something like that, your ability to say, I don't know what happens when you die, who knows, I don't care. You know, all of a sudden, you care. You, you can't avoid that question anymore. And in, and it does have repercussions then. Uh, what you have built, you know, is your house built on sand or is it built on rock? It will matter. I've seen it. I've heard it. Um, I've experienced it myself, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So you can go to the next slide. So my journey so far. So what I, I'm just going to share with you, um, back in June of last year, I went into the ER, which I had a kidney, I've had kidney stones, and those of you who had kidney stones, you know, it's not fun, and once you get past your first one, you're like, oh, I know what this is, going to ER. <laughs> it's not a big deal anymore, it hurts, but, so my wife and I went to the ER, and, and you know, they took the CAT scan and all that stuff, and we're waiting, and I'm just waiting for the standard, you know, you come back, you got a stone in your left kidney, and here's some meds, and you know, just... And we're waiting, waiting, and the doctor comes in and goes, uh, you don't have a kidney stone. I'm like, what? He goes, uh, you, have, you have growths all over your body and all your lymph nodes. Uh, hopefully it's not cancer, but I don't know. You're, I would go see your primary doctor or oncologist. And so, uh, bye. What? <laughs> Megan and I are like, what? Is this like a Twilight Zone episode? I have no symptoms, you know. So we go home, and we kind of stare at each other for a while, like shell shock. Like, what did we just hear? What? And uh, you know, what they tell you when when you are. Um, Diagnose, or when you think, you know, you, there's like a, a beginning period of any of this stuff where you, they don't know what you have, you know something's wrong, they're giving an indication like, mm, this could be something bad, but you don't have a formal diagnosis. So what do you do? You go to Dr. Google, right? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Within about two days, not only was I convinced myself I had terminal cancer, but I had malaria and hoof and mouth disease too at the same time. Um, but that night I was laying there, so you know I'm in this, I know I've got growths all over my body and that's not a good thing. Okay, it's not a tumor, it's like I lit up like a Christmas tree. So it's a leukemia, lymphoma type of thing. And it's spread. So I remember laying there late at night in the middle of the night thinking about this and 
it was almost a little bit of an out-of-body experience because I could watch myself thinking about this and emotionally thinking about this. And my reactions were not denial. My reactions were not being angry at God. You know, God, how could you do this to me? I mean, look, you know, come on, give me a break. Uh, my reaction was more like many other people say, it's not why me, but why not me? I mean, we're all going to have to do something. I, I've had cancer in, in my, uh, my family, so I didn't, I thought I would have something down the road, but down the road is not 62. Down the road is like 92 to me. Of course, we all think like that, right? So I, I didn't blame God, and I said, all right, Lord, um, you know, I'll get through this or not, and, uh, you know, and, and so I didn't panic. My house didn't fall apart in sand, you know, uh, and it was a weird, I, I, I acknowledged that almost like outside of my body. It's like, wow, I really believe what I said I believe. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. I'm like, this isn't the end, you know, as Martin Luther King once said, you know, death to a Christian is not a period, it's a comma. And so knowing that you're going to be seeing everyone that you love, that it's a believer, again, physically for the rest of eternity, is a great comfort. That is the Christian hope. Now, you immediately then say, well, all right, but what is this going to do to my kids? What is it do to my wife, you know, my friends? You know, so there's, there's lots of emotions there. Um, it took about four weeks in a hospital stay to get a formal diagnosis, and it was uh, uh, lymphoma. And of course, I won the lottery, so I got a rare lymphoma. You know, it's called mantle cell lymphoma, and it's, it was stage four and non-curable. So that's good news. Uh, but my particular version of it wasn't as aggressive as it could be, so it's quote-unquote manageable. It's going to come back multiple times, and they just have to treat it with different treatments over the course of the next 10, 15 years, whatever. Or not, you know, there's, there's, it's a crapshoot a little bit. Um, the, one, the one thing uh, I did come to realize very quickly, and maybe some of you or I know you go through the prayer list in our church, we have people right now struggling with uh, cancers and other, other deadly uh, things. With cancer itself, it, it feels like you just answer, uh, entered cancer land. There's this walled off area that's called cancer land. Now you can go visit it, you can get a visa, like if you have a loved one you're taking care of or visiting or a friend that, that has something. But until you have it, you're, you don't have the passport, all right? But once you get in there, you can then look at it, uh, somebody else with cancer like, oh, okay. Because it's hard to explain what it feels like, even physically, you know, like chemo or radiation or whatever. It's, it's just hard. Um, so that was interesting. Now, I'm not gonna say that my belief in the resurrected Christ and that he will come back at the end of the day um, has made me into the stoic Superman, like, uh, I don't fear death at all. You know, uh, I don't fear it theologically, uh, emotionally, I don't think so. Um, but I'm not the physically bravest person. I've done some weird things in my life that, but mostly it was when I was young, so I didn't know any better when I was in the military. You know, so it's not bravery, it's stupidity. It's like, okay. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's do it again. Um, but I can, I can give you two evidences of why I don't consider myself uh, any kind of special in that regard, because one, I'm a husband and a father. What does that mean? Well, I've seen my wife take care of two kids, the house, bills, 
while she has 101 fever and sniffling. If I had a 99 fever and I was the husband, I would be on the couch moaning, groaning, could you get me an orange juice? It's so terrible. That's what husbands do. Uh, the other one is, uh, there's uh, John DeLong, who's the elder here and is a good friend of mine. We were fishing buddies uh, a couple years ago. Uh, this is a, a question for, to see if you're local or not here in the Keys. Anybody know what a sabiki rig is? Uh, okay, we got a couple. A sabiki rig is a special type of uh, fishing lure. It's, it's got the tiniest little hair hooks. I mean, these are the smallest hooks they make. And you usually like five of them on a row, and you use it to catch little bait fish, which then you use to catch big fish. Uh, I can't throw a cast net to save my life, so I always use a sabiki. And you dip it, and then you get some pilchards, and you bring them in. But sabikis are notorious for like getting stuck on your shirt and your hat, and they wrap around things, and once in a while they get in your arm, and it's, it's a pain. But um, So <laughs> John and I were fishing one day, and my boat came back, and we were, he was handing rods up to me, those of you fish, you know what's coming, right? So he handed my sabiki rod up to me, and I grabbed it, and I grabbed it right on the sabikis. And one of them got embedded in my index finger, down pretty deep with the barb. And I'm like, oh. So he's like, oh, I'll get it off. And he's like, and I'm like, no. So I had to go sit down. John's like, you know, all right, here's some ice. And he, he, was, he thought he was going to have to call 911 because I was about to faint. So after about 20 minutes of numbing this thing, he was able to like wink it out. And even then he, he thought he was going to have to carry me upstairs. Now I'd like, uh, I, I think over the last eight months of treatments and stuff and tests, I have been poked and prodded and you name it, I've been drilled, you know, take, had things put in me, take things taken out of me. Uh, so my threshold of uh, discomfort and that stuff is much higher than probably had ever been in my life. If, if I went, you know, next week and they say, hey, we have a new test and we're going to put a big needle in one ear and it'll come out the other, I'm like, okay, whatever, just give me some lidocaine, one more thing. However, if they say, hey, we got a new test, we're going to put a sabiki in your finger, I would pass out right there and they would have to give me general anesthesia to do it. I didn't, don't know why, but so there is still fear there, right? I, I'm not like, you know, totally numb to that. Go to the next one, please. Now, there is a, a standard model for grief, whether someone's dying or you're grieving over somebody or, or some event, and it's the Kubler-Ross five-stage thing where you start out with denial, then your anger, then you bargain, like, all right, if you make this go away, I'll, I'll never eat Twizzlers again, or whatever. Uh, there's depression, and then there's finally acceptance. Um, I, and, and that might be right for a lot of people, but I, I have, through this uh, journey, I've been able to connect with a lot, a lot of uh, patients around the country and the world, uh, through the internet, through Facebook, and uh, we all support each other going through because it's a fairly rare uh, lymphoma, and I don't, I don't see, I have not seen anyone go through the denial phase. When, when a doctor shows you a PET scan, it's like there it is, you look like a Christmas tree. No, that's not right. Uh, no, so uh, I, I have not seen even in my my own journey the denial phase. I think that most, most people, including myself, initially go through the shock phase. It's like, what? What? And you're kind of staring there like, what'd you just say? <sighs> you know, you're, you're kind of like, but after that, you know, certainly there's, there's fear and I've seen anger. Uh, I've seen people be angry with God, even the God they're not sure they believe in. Like, why are you doing this to me now? I got small kids at home, or 
you know, why would a good God do this to me? Um, and it seems like for those that have uh, a, a strong faith in Christian uh, good news, um, they can go through, uh, you know, depressions, and we can go through the ups and downs, but it's not a hopelessness. It's not a panic-driven, cosmic, like, all right, I've never asked the question before. I have no idea what, if this happens, where am I going to be? If you've never asked that, that's, the, that's kind of a rough time to ask when it's staring you in the face. You can't avoid it, and you don't really have a lot of basis. Now, hopefully, those questions will help people ask the right questions, and they could be around people who can then you know, present the gospel and present the Christian hope and, and walk alongside them. But I do see kind of a fork in the road for unless you've already asked that question and you've tr kind of twirled it around in your mind and, and connected it to belief and scripture, it's, it's a rough period there because it's, it's something that you never thought you would deal with. It's out of your mind. So, um, I believe that there are, if you're an atheist, my belief, if you're an atheist, your, your house is made on sand. You know, the, the, the way you've constructed your belief system and what, what you think is right, it's on sand. It can shift. But you're not going to know that until the resurrection, <laughs> You know, what C.S. Lewis says, when Christ comes back, the time of choosing is over. It's to see now which side did you choose. You can't choose again once you're there. Uh, so an atheist, if they're really hardcore atheists and they can maintain it all the way through the actual death, they're going to find out that the house that they built was on sand. It'll crumble away in the, in the light of truth. For an agnostic who hasn't really, I don't know, maybe there's a God, maybe not, I'm not really into organized religion, and I never even thought about death, I don't know, you know, who knows where, where we go. Um, that house is built on sand, but that house starts quaking during your lifetime, because they, normally, you're, you got to be forced to think about it. You know, you're, at two o'clock in the morning, you're staring at the ceiling, what else are you going to think about? When, when you're in that situation. So you're, even for a Christian, you know, I, I, I feel like a, a, an experience like this is a stress testing of your faith. It's like, do you really believe what you believe? You know, what does it mean when it really becomes a matter of, of a reality or potential reality? Uh, there are a lot of verses in Scripture all through the Old Testament, New Testament, that talk about suffering and going through bad times. Uh, I, I want to just pick out two, just kind of as a, as a way to kind of set the stage. So if you can go to the next slide. So the first one, uh, John 16 33, Jesus is, is telling his disciples, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When things like this happen, these verses become super real. They take on a whole new depth. Okay, how do you not fall apart? Well, how do you not be angered at God? Well, Jesus said, this is a fallen world. You know, who gave me cancer? Did God give me cancer? No, you gave me cancer. I gave me cancer. This world was not meant to be like this. It didn't have, it wasn't supposed to have death, disease, decay, war, killing, evil. It wasn't meant to be like that. We screwed it up. The good news is God's putting it right. Okay, so uh, next, uh, next verse, 2 Corinthians, um, Paul's, you know, and, and remember, 
I'm not Paul, right? You know, Paul was like the, um, the what do you call it? The, the, not the Ener Energizer buddy, but the thing he knocked down and always gets up. Uh, he was stoned, he was in prison, he was whipped, he was, you know, for a course of 20 years, and he never wavered. And he always came back and just went to the gospel again, and, and you couldn't stop him. So he says, you know, he's trying to uh, encourage the, the Corinthians, the church in Corinth. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, an acknowledgement of suffering, right, of persecution. Um, but, but not crushed, meaning we're not completely flattened. We might be hurt, we might be scared, but we are not crushed. Perplexed, like, I don't understand all the reasons why this is happening, this is happening now, why do people do that, but not in despair. Okay. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So that's, to me, a, a great description of this ability, no matter how hard it gets, to have that core base of a house built on rock. Yes, the, the house could be in a shambles, but it's not built on sand. You have the Christian hope. You know, that the God, God is with you, and God will be with you, and Jesus will make you whole. Um, and I want to kind of close with a couple things. Uh, and again, there's no one right way to do this for anybody going through these situations. I found that there were three types of prayers in Scripture that have really helped me through this. Okay, and I want to share those with you. Um, so the three ways I pray now, I, of course I pray every night for patience, for guidance, for endurance, for my family, for the, my loved ones, for other people who are going through this, for people in the church that are struggling with health issues. That's my petitions every night. Um, but the first one here... Uh, I pray the scripture has really spoke to me about God's general protection and grace. So if you look at uh, Psalm 91.4, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Now that, that verse has always somehow really resonated with me. Just the kind of metaphor, the picture of having this massive, almighty bird that's, you know, size of the Empire State Building, and you and your family and loved ones are kind of huddled down, the wind's howling, and bad things are happening in your life, and these massive wings are nestling you against that. That has always been a very comforting image to me. And if you go to the next slide... Um, it's hard to read, but that's, that's, psalm, that's the psalm, 91.4. And that's sitting in my office. It's, it's just got an embroidered set of wings. I thought it was good. Now, Tony, I believe, often talks about a woo-woo moment, right? And I think it's you, or it might be you, Trevor. I, I can't tell the difference anymore. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's an insult on you or him. I, I don't. Uh, a woo moment is, you know, you can, it's like you look back and you're like, oh, is that the Holy Spirit doing that? I couldn't, that's quite a coincidence. I bought that, that picture a month before I went to the ER room. For, on a whim. I'm like, you know, I need to have that in front of me in my office. I don't know why. How about that for a woo-woo moment? Um, next slide, please. In another way, another scripture, and another way I pray is you look at, uh, again, in Corinthians, uh, Paul, Paul saying about the body of Christ, you know, the, the people, the church. 
But God has composed the body and has given greater honor to its parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its members should have mutual concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And the reason this resonates with me is, is when you go through something like this and you're a believer, you are generally surrounded with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're praying for you, but also practically they're going through it with you. Hey, I need help. You know, can you, can somebody do something? You know, I, because even if I'm feeling crappy, then Megan's tied up helping me. So it's like, we need help. And I have seen over the years, especially through our life group and, and our close friends, one of the hardest things, even for a Christian to do, is ask for help. Because we're just not read like that. Right? I don't want, I don't want to burn people. You know, oh, I don't want. What you're doing is stopping your ability to bless other people by them helping you should be the way you think about it. Because then someday you will bless them, you, know, you will help them. Or not, it's not, a, it's not a, well, you owe me one, I owe you one. That's, we are commanded as Christians, as you see in that body of Christ description, we are in it together. Your suffering is my suffering. Your honor is my honor. So act like it. Open up. Okay, That's been an important one for me. Uh, next slide, last one. Uh, the God that knows suffering and fear. Uh, this is uh, from Matthew, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what's coming. He knows it's going to be incredibly horrific, being beaten, dragged through the streets, being crucified, and, which is, was the worst way they could execute anybody. So he says, he took Peter... And the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So if my Lord and Master can ask his Father, you know, if there's any way you can take this cup from me, please, but if not your will, then I can ask God to take this cup away from me. That's not being uh, a coward. And I pray that sometimes. Like, God, can't you just take this cup from me? I don't particularly want to do this for the next 5, 15, 20 years. If somebody could take it away in a second, I would do it in a heartbeat. Uh, and I know uh, my dear friend, Pastor uh, Larry O'Neill, is not here today, but I've, I've sat with him many months talking about that. He's a cancer survivor. Um, and um, we all have different ways of thinking about this. You can say, well, the cancer is a blessing. Look what you're able to do with this. I'm like, it's a suffering. <laughs> I don't want anybody to have this blessing. I don't want to have this blessing. If the cup can pass for me, I would do it in a second. Okay? But if not, then it's your will. I mean, we'll do what we got to do. All right? But at the same time, if this is an opportunity to, to share Christ's love through example and through preaching and through teaching and writing or whatever, then, then that's, that's good. Um. So, I guess what I wanted to, to impart you, with you today is just some of those learnings and ahas I've had through this. Now, the rest of the story is I, I went through uh, six months of chemo and immuno, immunotherapy. Um, I've had a couple complications, but all my scans have come back negative, so they can't detect the cancer. So, I'm in full remission. But my type of cancer will always come back. Could be Three years, could be 10 years, who knows. But the good news is medicine has, is a revolution right now in, in cancer treatment, so there are multiple treatments. 
So it's something at least we're hoping is that you can manage like diabetes for the rest of your life. And one of my doctors says, well, you'll probably die for something else. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> that's comforting. No, but that's true. I mean, we're all going to do some, something. But I wanted to give you that insight. I wanted to kind of share with you on a personal testimony what I've gone through and what that felt like because I thought it was interesting. I thought it was apropos of Easter, that's for sure. So if you go to, to the last slide. So one of my favorite um, verses, you know, is in Peter where he says, you know, always be prepared to give an explanation of the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. You know, what is that Christian hope? To me, and especially when you start thinking about this stuff, the Christian hope that you get out of Revelation, when Jesus comes back, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. That's the Christian hope. That's the belief. That's the bedrock that we build our house on. And we don't often think about it in practical terms because we're not built to do that, but sometimes it slaps you in the face. So I'd like to... Uh, close with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we've had together. We pray that uh, an unbelieving world or an uncertain world can hear the message through us that you've given us and the command that you've given us and commission to help them understand, help them gain that bedrock that they can build their house on, which is the only bedrock that exists, which is you, Lord. And we so are thankful that you've come down and disabled death, and we look forward to the time when we're all together in a remade heaven and earth, in a new body to be forever with our believer family and friends, and with you, Lord, worshiping God in eternity. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.